This video is brought to you by Display. In part 1, we learned about Maul's rise. Darth Sidious stole Maul from other Talzin and used him as his assassin, announcing the return of the Sith after a thousand years. He would be cut down, but return, enhanced through mechanics and Night Sister magics, going on to create a criminal empire and taking the Mandalorian homeworld. Wielding his crimson blade alongside the Darksaber, he sat upon the throne of the galaxy's greatest warrior culture and exacted his vengeance on Obi-Wan Kenobi. In part 2, we will not spoil the events of the Clone Wars Season 7, and I will pass over the events of the Ahsoka book that overlap with the Siege of Mandalore. We will see Maul's fall at the hands of his old master, and how this Knight Brother desperately seeks out powers other than just the Sith. Raising the Crimson Dawn, gaining ancient wisdom to merge the light and dark side of the Force, and harness the magics of the clan that he was once ripped away from as a child all while maintaining an undying fire to see Kenobi and Sidious burn to ash. After Satine was killed, her old Jedi love was sent to rot in prison, but during Kenobi's transport, bo launches a rescue mission with her Death Watch loyalists. Their escape would push Maul to launch the full Maldalorian Guard to pursue them, resulting in a massive battle between these split Death Watch forces, causing just the most recent in a long line of Mandalorian civil wars. When Sidious arrives on this Outer Rim planet, Maul detects a disturbance in the Force, something of incredible darkness that seems to be drawing nearer. I sense a presence, a presence I haven't felt since Master. The guards are effortlessly dispatched, and Maul drops to a knee, acting subservient to his old master. But Sidious is not one to be deceived, and just moments after his triumph, 12 brutal years to climb out from the scraps to the Mandalorian throne, Maul's master was here to take it all away. While the civil war is consuming the city, bo makes a decision that will change the course of Mandalore forever, setting them on the path that 29 years later would see the great Mandalorian clans fractured and living in hiding. She tells Kenobi that he must get the Republic involved in liberating Mandalore to oust this Sith Lord Darth Maul. Go back to your Republic and tell them what has happened. That would likely lead to a Republic invasion of Mandalore. Yes, and Maul will die. But Mandalore will survive. We always survive. Back at the Royal Palace, five Crimson Blades are clashing in a fight for the position of the true Sith Lord. His immense powers in the dark side energize Sidious' movements, and gives him the power to hurl Maul at ease. And though Savage was strong enough to easily beat down Jedi, this old man is not repelled. Sidious' speed, strength, and accuracy prove too much for Savage, who is impaled and then sent flying out into the courtyard below. Just as Savage rushed to his brother Feral's side during Ventress's trials on Dathomir, Maul ignores Sidious and rushes down to comfort his brother. In his dying words, Savage reveals that through all the Night Sister magic and even Maul's Sith training, he knows he never fully became a monster. I'm not like you. I never was. <laughs> Sidious looms over his fallen apprentice, saying how he has long since replaced this weak Sabrak, that his old apprentice is no longer a Sith. Maul calls on his rage to fuel his strikes now with the remains of his severed saber staff and the dark saber. He is able to keep up with his master, even landing a powerful kick, but Sidious knows that he can end this with his mastery of the dark side, fighting only with the power of the force. He sends his once apprentice high into the air and crashes him down into the permacrete, up again and over into the courtyard wall, until he senses this Sith pretender is finally broken. Have mercy. Uh, please, please. There is no mercy. And just how Maul tortured Kenobi not with death, but the promise of a life stripped of everything and thrown in a cell, his old master does the same. I'm not going to kill you. I have other uses for you. <laughs> Maul would be restrained and taken prisoner to the Outer Rim world of Stygian Prime, where the CIS maintained a high security fortress known as the Spire. He brings Dooku in front of Maul just to drive him mad, and later reveals that he will use Maul to draw out Mother Talzin. Sidious knows that her bodily form was killed during Dooku and Grievous's previous attack, but can sense her spirit still roams the Witch's lands. The Dark Lord knows that Almec had ordered some of the top Mandalorians to launch a rescue mission, led by Gar Saxon. And back at his cell, we see that Dooku is using Force Lightning to torture Maul, telling him that though the Huts have abandoned his Shadow Collective, the Pikes and Black Sun are loyal. He wants to know their location and leaders so that the Count could take control of this underworld coalition. Death Watch rockets take out Droidicas and B2s while the strike team works its way towards Maul's cell. 
By blasting a hole in the fortress wall, they are able to zipline to freedom, quickly flying away via a Kamer class fighter. From here, the loyal criminals and Death Watch forces are rallied on Zanbar, their old base from before the coup. Here, Almec says that this is repayment for breaking him out of jail, and Saxon reveals that they were able to recover the Darksaber from the palace courtyard. They all know that Dooku may be arriving at any second, as the Count's previous alliance with Death Watch may lead him back to Zanbar. And just moments later, C-9979 dropships approach, but many are blown out of the sky by heavy turbo laser emplacements. Grievous understands the caliber of these fighters, pointing out that these are not mere clones, and so he holds nothing back. B-2s, Commandos, and Droidicas lead the assault. But the comeback Sith is in good stride, slashing down droid after droid with Mandalorian blade. Grievous and his Magna Guard swoop in over Maul, and with crackling purple energy engage their Electro Staffs. These droids are trained to combat Jedi, but they are still defeated. Then Grievous drops down and starts laying waste to Death Watch Maul DeLoreans. The unending swarm of droids eventually cuts down the rest of Maul's forces. Just then, the fighters screech overhead and drop their payloads, consuming the battlefront in flames. While another of the fighters come in with a loading ramp extended in order to rescue Maul, a move seen all those years ago with Qui-Gon Jinn. Grievous admits to Dooku that Maul's combined forces nearly defeated him, but that Maul has been crushed by this loss. Ordering a full retreat, the Black Sun, Pike, and Death Watch ships all flee. And on the way, we see that Maul can meditate on the Force and connect with his lost mother. Her spirit bursts forth and uses his body as a vessel to speak through. It is revealed that the amassing of the Shadow Collective and taking of Mandalore was all a part of their plot to draw Sidious out. They will trap him and finally defeat him on the homeworld from which Maul was stolen from all those years ago. But for now, they must assume Sidious let him escape, and they will first rally at Ord Mantell, where Black Sun has a stronghold. Once on world, Maul rallies the crime leaders and explains that though the CIS is immensely powerful, they are also stretched out across the galaxy, fighting the Clone Wars on countless fronts. We see that in secret, Dooku explains to Grievous that this witch mother is powerful enough to pose a threat to Sidious' plans. Maul points out where he wants the droids led for an ambush, and where the anti-aircraft defenses should be placed. While on the main landing pad, a shuttle reveals that Knight Brothers have come to help in the fight. Orbital bombardment begins with the fire from several Munificent class, droid supply ships, and C-9979s in orbit. Once the city's defenses had been believed destroyed, the landing craft were sent in. Hordes of droids are met by Shadow Collective forces, while Dooku and the Magna Guards make their way to the main palace. In orbit, Grievous and his T-Series droids are ambushed by several squadrons of Comer class gauntlet fighters. While back in the palace, Dooku is met by the Knight Brothers. Hoping to cut the head off of the CIS invading force, Maul heads straight for the command ship, setting down on the Munificent and breaching its hull. Storming onto the bridge, Maul force pushes the droid crew into scrap metal, and puts the Darksaber right up to Grievous's cyborg throat, telling him to deactivate the droids or die. Though the battle droids did not require a signal to operate, an improvement made since that weakness was exposed during the Battle of Naboo, these droids do still contain an emergency shutoff that could only be issued by the top general. Just as the Shadow Collective was overwhelmed, the droids went limp, and as Dooku was killing the last of the Knight Brothers, these combined forces come to the rescue, turning the tables on the Count, who is now Maul's prisoner. Back on the CIS command ship, Maul calls to his mother. She praises him and assures Maul that next will come the capture of Darth Sidious himself. And on Coruscant, Palpatine is trying to use the re-emergence of Maul to fill in the character of that rogue Sith that was manipulating the Clone Wars all along. The Supreme Chancellor says that the Jedi and Clone Army must do whatever they can to capture the Sith, and perhaps then, there shall be peace. Kenobi and Tipley are chosen to search a Mandalorian supply depot near Ord Mantell. Meanwhile, Maul has his captives contact their lord, and he proudly shows off how he bested this replacement apprentice and his top general. Sidious calmly says just to dispose of them, but cracks and shows that this was not what he expected. As the Jedi arrive in the system, Kenobi assures Tipley that his emotions are in check, even after what Maul did to Satine. Maul keeps Dooku in his chambers, and reveals that Mother Talzin is still alive, and that she has a plan for defeating Sidious, if only Dooku would align with them. Together, they could combine CIS forces with the Shadow Collective, and with their Force powers and her Night Sister magics, they could defeat Sidious. In her spirit form, she tells him the story of Maul being ripped away from her, used and discarded at Sidious's whim and warns the Count that this too will be his future. But just then, Republic forces discover their location, and deploy gunships and fighters. During the confusion, Dooku calls on the Force to open the cells, and Grievous bursts free. 
The secret base is carved into an asteroid surrounded by a dense asteroid field. But by detecting his presence in the Force, the Jedi know where to land their ships. The terrifying speed and strength of the cyborgs allows Grievous to rip through the guards and into an escape craft. And knowing that they will have to work together, Maul frees Dooku and gives him back his lightsaber. Mace Windu and Ayla Sakura arrive with backup, and Dooku opens up with a volley of lightning. Sakura is kicked by Maul, while Tipley is force pulled into Dooku's blade. A Mandalorian rocket bursts and splits up Dooku and Sakura, allowing the Sith to escape, while Maul promises Kenobi that he will see him again. When reports are made to the Chancellor, we see that Palpatine fears that his plans may very well have backfired this time. While in the cockpit of the Comerc, the Shadow Collective vents their fears that Maul has forgotten that their alliance was about profit and power, not revenge. But Maul knows that if Sidious is dead, he can become the galaxy's puppet master, and in a flash he has Dooku taken away, suspecting that their alliance was all part of his old master's plan. They then set down on Dathomir. Hauled into the Night Sister Temple, Maul calls forth to his mother, who starts exacting her own vengeance on Dooku. In orbit, the scimitar is decloaked. Maul's old ship was secreted away by Sidious when he learned of his apprentice's failure on Naboo. All these years later, its stealth, surveillance, and jamming technology was still some of the best in the galaxy. The perfect way to rescue Grievous and make their way to this dark side magic imbued world. Mother Talzin starts draining Dooku's life force, and given enough time, she would be able to be made flesh once more. Maul savors this moment and leans in to tell his replacement that his mother had drained herself to restore Maul back when she cleansed his mind and binded his legs. But she waited, ever patient, knowing that her son would bring her one strong in the Force, so that she could devour their life force and make herself reborn. But Sidious would make his reappearance to the Witch's Temple, the place where he had first met Talzin decades before. He tells Maul that he continues to miss the lesson being taught to him by the Dark Side, that only Sidious's plan shall govern the universe. As Maul confronts his old master, Dooku's body rises, possessed by the spirit of Mother Talzin. She attacks, but is repelled. Sidious knows he cannot toy with her. He pumps his full force into disarming and then shocking her into submission. Grievous and Maul are stunned by the duel between these masters of different dark side arts. And as Dooku's body falls, the Witch Mother rises fully formed through the power of her Night Sister magics. Maul force pushes Grievous out of the temple, while Talzin taunts the Sith Lord that stole her son. Long has she waited. As their lightning interlocked, they were at a stalemate until Dooku awoke. Maul joins his mother, amplifying her strength, but when Dooku adds to the storm, she can sense that again, she has been outplayed. She has been bested by the Sith. Desperately, Maul begs that his mother, the only living family Maul knows, try to escape with him. But she knows that her force field is all that holds back this deadly tangle of Sith lightning. As Grievous makes his way back into the temple, Talzin uses the last burst of energy to hurl her son into the arms of the Maul Delorean allies. Talzin drops to the floor and meets her ultimate end at the hands of General Grievous. Maul's last image being these two Jedi blades taking her life, and her magics failing the flesh, quickly eroding into a twisted husk. Dooku worries about Maul's escape, but is assured that they will finally take Dathomir and have no Night Sister magic to worry about while Maul is moving into place as his unknowing pawn. He would return to Mandalore, where he would regain control through Almec, but now he and his loyalist forces would go into an even deeper hiding. Maul assumed that Sidious would still be searching for him, not knowing that the true plan was to leave Maul in place on the Mandalorian homeworld. In the final days of the war, the Grand Army of the Republic would launch the Siege of Mandalore. In order of threats to Palpatine's plans, first would be a rival Sith Night Sister alliance, the combined power of Maul, Savage, and Mother Talzin. With that eliminated, the next biggest threat to the Empire's rule would be from the Mandalorians, the war-loving race with thousands of years of independence. The Jedi Order would be alarmed that this secret Sith was still alive and ruling Mandalore, thinking Maul may have been that Sith Master all along, manipulating the entire Clone Wars from this neutral world. Fitting the reports by Obi-Wan, and the invasion would be something that Bo-Katan had asked for. The former Jedi Padawan Ahsoka Tano would receive a warm welcome back to the GAR by the 501st. And as a Jedi General, she and Rex would head the assault on the capital with the 332nd Company, a subsect formed out of the 501st for this mission to take Mandalore. I've chosen to pass over the details of the Siege of Mandalore, as it will be covered in Season 7 of The Clone Wars. The Ahsoka book details much of this final battle, but I thought best not to spoil these parts as many have not read that book yet. But as shown in other lore, suffice it to say Maul would get away, while Ahsoka and Rex went into hiding each knowing the secret, true Sith Master had outmaneuvered the entire galaxy. 
Maul now only had one ally left, the loyal members of the Shadow Collective. Hiding in the thick jungles and cavernous rocky terrain of Dathomir, Maul would spend the next nine years transforming these criminals into a new organization called Crimson Dawn. Again, a puppet leader would be necessary, and would come in the form of Dryden Vos. Though never reaching the level of the Huts, they were one of the most powerful criminal empires at this time. But when this puppet was killed by Solo and his associates, Maul tells Kira that she has been promoted. What became of this organization is as of yet unknown, but it is clear that the Force had a greater plan for Maul than just Crime Boss. Still intent on discovering a way to get revenge on Sidious, he traveled to the world that started his training as a child, to the ancient Sith world of Malachor. Survivor of Order 66, Kanan Jarrus, his apprentice, and Ahsoka then came to visit the temple. Ezra is separated from them and approached by this mysterious man. Call me... Old Master. As the young Jedi is led through the ash-covered battlefront, Maul reveals that he knows of the Inquisitors, that each of them, and their master, are his enemy as well. He reveals that he was a Force wielder, but no Jedi, leading Ezra to call him a Sith, while quickly raising his blade. Maul explains that he is no Sith, and now we learn how he sees things. The Sith took everything from me, ripped me from my mother's arms, murdered my brother, used me as a weapon, and then cast me aside. But this doesn't mean that Maul has rejected the wisdom of Sith teachings. He understands that there is truth in their methods of making one strong in the Force. In the first of the Temple's trials, it requires them to work together. Symbolic of the rule of two, one must lift the first block, and the other the second, and then repeat this throughout a narrow shaft. And while giving his instructions, we see Maul referencing lines in the ancient Sith code that reads, Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion I gain strength. Through strength I gain power. Through power I gain victory. Through victory my chains are broken. The Force shall set me free. Your passions give you strength, and through strength you gain power. Meanwhile, on the level above, Kanan and Ahsoka have subdued the Inquisitor named the Eighth Brother and they try to figure out why he was there before they even arrived. Who was he hunting? But you are not expecting us. Who are you after? <laughs> A shadow. Deep inside of the Sith Temple, Maul and his new apprentice have discovered the Holocron Chamber. But again, to access it needs these two to work as one. Ezra calls on the Force to leap across the crevasse, while Maul must also force push him to make it across. And as he grabs the Sith Holocron, the temple comes to life for the first time in over a thousand years, opening up at the peak and raising the central platform. Ezra again must trust his life to Maul, and leaps down to be caught in the forest and pulled up towards the old master. Maul savors this combination of fear and trust in the young Jedi, as he easily could have ripped the Holocron out of his hands and left Ezra to fall into oblivion. Outside the temple, the fifth brother and seventh sister respond to the Inquisitor's SOS call. While inside of the pyramid, Maul hints that he knows about the true power of this Sith installation. Sith holocrons are keys that can open many doors. This temple would later prove to have one of the doors to the world between worlds. One of the most mysterious and powerful tools in the entire galaxy, allowing one to walk through time and alter past and future events. Maul seems to have understood this ability, and was hoping to use it to undermine Sidious by attacking him at some crucial point in the past. But for now, the plan is simple, to escape here alive. As they exit the temple, they walk right into the latest battle between light and dark on Malachor. Being a man who has survived it all, suffered through the highs and lows alongside Jedi and Sith allies alike, Maul's response is genuine amusement at this series of events. What fun! <laughs> what fun! <laughs> to prove his alliance with these Jedi, he says that he has given up his Sith title. Darth Maul lives. Formerly Darth, now just Maul. On this world where he started his Sith training nearly five decades earlier, where his burning hatred for the Jedi would be imprinted, and a passion to bring about the revenge of the Sith, he now found himself fighting in between these two groups, working in line with his own vision. The Inquisitors are terrified to think that he has acquired the Holocron. The Holocron, do you have it? You will find out soon enough. Well, Ahsoka has seen him rise from the shadows before, and calmly asks him what his new plot is. Maul, what game are you playing? The end game, Lady Tano. The ex-Sith uses the logic of his Mandalorian allies during the Clone Wars, said by Vizsla and Bo-Katan. 
I am the enemy of your enemy now, and I have my own reasons for wanting the Empire to fall. But we have little time. The one they call Vader will be here soon. And goes on to explain that the Inquisitors fleeing means that they must have called in Vader. Maul knows that Darth Vader is Sidious's latest expendable apprentice. And he tells the Jedi that their ambushing Vader here and now would be the best shot they have at killing the Emperor's second in command. He also tells them that they can learn the power of this device by attaching the holocron to the obelisk at the pyramid's peak. And as they ascend, they split up and are set upon by the Inquisitors. Maul hopes to turn Ezra to the dark side, to strike down the Seventh Sister as she was helplessly being force choked. But to Maul's anger, the Jedi can't do it. Seeing that a ship is approaching, Ezra is told to rush to the peak, while Maul jumps into the fray. He quickly dispatches the fifth brother, while the eighth brother is forced to his death. When Kanan asks where his apprentice has gone, Maul reveals part of his plan. Where's Ezra? You mean my apprentice? He lunges at Kanan, striking at his head, and although the Jedi pulls away just in time, his eyes are melted by the crimson blade. The pure red of a Sith saber was the last thing Kanan would ever see. Where Maul came here to experience a vision of ancient Sith falling to Jedi blades, this Jedi would forever lose his vision on Malachor. But Maul underestimated how strong this survivor of Order 66 was. On this ancient Sith world, Kanan would have to completely give in to the light side of the Force, let it guide his every action. As Maul went to strike, the Jedi would counter with stunning speed and efficiency, knocking the shadow off balance and hurling him off the edge of the temple. If he could not access the world between worlds, if this temple could unleash the energy of its superweapon, he could kill all of these Jedi and Vader at the same time. And while Ezra unknowingly activated this weapon, Vader would arrive and face off against his old apprentice, Ahsoka Tano. Kanan and Ezra would rip out the holocron, resulting in a full meltdown of the complex. Though this method of attacking Sidious was lost, Maul would commandeer the Inquisitor's TIE Fighter and escape Malachor, while Maul's words found root in Ezra, tempted by the dark side and letting it consume him enough to unlock the holocron. Months would go by as Maul meditated on the Force and tracked the movements of the growing Rebel Alliance trying to locate the ship that brought him his apprentice. By storming a Sphirna class corvette, Maul takes the crew prisoner and tortures them until they reveal the location of the ghost. And thinking that they had come upon the remains of an Inquisitor attack, Kanan calms Hera, only to find out that Maul has been able to capture the entire crew. He promises to release them all, in exchange for the Sith holocron that they had taken from Malachor, but also Kanan's Jedi holocron. Seeing his love Hera so close to execution, Kanan agrees, an example of why the Jedi of old warned against such attachments. Jedi Holocron, give that to me as well. Kanan, no. Fine. On board the Ghost, Maul is taking an interest in the Spectre's home. He wants a tour, to see the belongings and lifestyle of these two Jedi. But Sabine tried to deny him, something the once ruler of Mandalore finds amusing. Mandalorian, you of all should trust me. Or did I not once rule your people? Checking out each of the rooms, he comes to Kanan's, where Maul horrifies Hera with the ability to search her mind. He even knows Kanan's true name at the time that he was an apprentice, from before Order 66. Kanan Jarrus. Or should I use his real name? Caleb Doom. And by probing deeper, he sees how they met Ezra, how he stole the Jedi holocron, and where Kanan has since placed it. While Maul tries desperately to open it up, his droid guard assistants are watching over the prisoners. These are militarized versions of the RIC-1200 tour guide droids that once provided a friendly face to visitors of Mandalore. Not the best combat automata, the crew are able to dispatch them and hide from the fallen Sith. They have an idea to take advantage of Maul's droid legs by engaging the powerful electromagnet in the cargo hold, ripping the half a Zabrak to the ceiling. But he is barely faced. Decades worth of countless scenarios enabled him to just focus on deflecting the bolts, deactivating the magnet, and using the force he neutralizes the specters. Meanwhile, Ezra and Kanan have returned to the planet Adalon to retrieve the Sith holocron. It was left with the Bendu, an ancient force wielder being that is neither Sith nor Jedi. In a series of tunnels that the Krikna call home, the holocron was exerting a sort of trance over these spider-like creatures. They are able to extract it and head to Maul's provided coordinates for rendezvous, the old Mandalorian asteroid outpost used when Maul had captured both Count Dooku and General Grievous. When the Jedi arrive, they see Maul has retained a relic from his time as leader of Death Watch, the black and red painted Commerce class Mandalorian gauntlet fighter. 
When Maul tries to shove Kanan out of an airlock, it is this ship that the Jedi is able to grab hold of and launch himself back towards the hangar bay. In a command room, the ex-Sith and young Jedi calmly seat themselves on the floor and meditate on their holocrons. As the devices open up immense dark and light side wisdom, they move closer and start to merge. This combination allows one to find the answer to any question they seek. Both wish to find the key to destroying the Sith. As the Force provides glimpses for the answer, Maul grows frantic as he only sees his ultimate fate. I see nothing, only oblivion. While Ezra starts to see a planet with two suns, Maul pushes him to peer further beyond the veil, but the specters arrive and Kanan's encouragement pulls Ezra back. The ritual is broken, creating an explosion of Force power, and in the confusion Maul escapes, nearly driven mad by the glimpses that he saw. In a voice full of anger and insanity, he keeps repeating one phrase. He lives. <laughs> the Spectres would carry on their fight against the Empire, but this ritual of combining dark and light sides has intertwined the minds of Ezra and Maul, similar but less powerful than the Force Dyad connection between Kylo and Rey. Memories were shared between the two, and a bond across time and space was made. Maul saw the secret rebel base, and Ezra experiences both audio and visual stimuli of Maul's presence. He isn't there in the sense that others can see him, but Kanan doubts that this is merely a hallucination or force vision. Maybe it was some kind of uh, force vision. Maybe. Although they try and move on and prep for the liberation of Lothal, Maul appears again, and in such a convincing way that Ezra attacks him and would have struck him down if Kanan did not intervene, showing Ezra that this was just a fellow rebel. When the Jedi go to seek guidance from the Bendu, Maul shows himself in the flesh and explains how their minds have been intertwined. When you abruptly severed our connection with the Holocron, you mixed up the information. You learned a bit of what I want to know, and I learned a bit of what you wanted to know. He says he will only take the Jedi alone, but they will work together to complete the vision they shared. Only this will give them the answer to defeating the Sith once and for all. But by using Ezra's comlink, the Spectres are able to track him to the planet Dathomir. On his homeworld, Maul tries to bond with the orphan boy by relaying the past of the Great Witches, his family that were all killed by the Empire, their Night Sister magic seen as too powerful. The answer given by the Force is in their minds, just fragmented and separated. The only way to link now would be through a Night Sister ritual. The only way to access the knowledge we seek is to merge our minds again. They would walk through the wreckage of the temple, which 17 years earlier saw Maul liberated from his damaged mind, and given new legs to launch his revenge. Eventually they come to Maul's quarters, a room full of relics from his former glory. A Mandalorian helmet, objects acquired through his Crimson Dawn crime empire, and most importantly, a shrine to the moment he got his revenge on Kenobi. Mandalorian artwork of the beloved Duchess scarred on the eyes and throat while below rested the very blade used to kill her. The blade used to symbolize the unification of the Mandalorians was used to honor the moment of their fall. Maul explains that he has been training in the Night Sister arts. He learned that the altar that rebirthed him and Savage was their source of power, the wellspring of the planet's naturally generated dark side magics. With a potion, they could merge their minds and together see that vision that was interrupted. Maul's glimpse reignites a thirst for vengeance that he had thought stolen from him. All official reports state that General Obi-Wan Kenobi, leader of the 212th Attack Battalion, was killed by his own men after it was revealed that the Jedi tried to take over the Republic. But the holocron vision showed his archenemy was alive, and with this ritual, he could learn the old Jedi's location. It ends where it began, a desert planet with twin suns. Both were answers to the same question, how to defeat the Sith. As Luke would help turn Vader to the light, it would be Obi-Wan that led Anakin's son into the Jedi path. But the trapped spirits of the Night Sisters wanted to be paid in blood for use of their arts, to use that life force to come back. Maul warns Ezra that they will try to possess the flesh, but Kanan and Sabine are caught. With the characteristic green magics animating the body and flowing out of the eyes, they try to kill Maul and Ezra. They are forced to run, with Maul showing the Jedi that his friends are trapped to the temple grounds, that they must take the chance to embrace their destiny and seek out that which can destroy the Sith. Ezra's denial infuriates Maul. Forget the past! Forget your memories! Forget your attachments! We can walk that path together! As friends! As brothers! 
As Maul runs off to the world which all those years ago he revealed the Sith to the Jedi, Ezra runs back to save his friends. In doing so, he cuts into the altar, causing the spirits to dissipate. Maul would spend the next months searching Tatooine. All he had was the knowledge that somewhere on these sand dune seas, the Jedi was in hiding. He could sense his presence, but again we see how this all-consuming want for vengeance was driving him mad. Like back on the trash heap planet Lotho Minor, he manically swings back and forth between self-pity and righteous anger. Will it end here? Like this? No. No. Kenobi. Kenobi! Back on the Rebel secret base, Ezra is awoken by a replay of Kenobi's message from the Jedi Temple, sent just moments after Order 66, warning the survivors not to return to Coruscant. He's unsure how this is happening, but he also hears Maul through the Sith holocron. Through their linked minds, just as Maul could so easily find Ezra, the Jedi can sense that Maul has gone to Tatooine to look for Kenobi. He then tells the Spectres of this, but Captain Rex reminds him of the personal accounts of Senator Organa. Ezra, no one would like to believe General Kenobi's alive more than I would, but Senator Organa confirmed his death. Defying Hera's orders to focus on the liberation of Lothal, he steals an A-Wing and heads for the desert world. By using the fragments of the Sith and Jedi holocrons, he can focus and let it guide him like a force compass. He tracks the sources down to a cavern and finds a fragment of the Sith holocron, but is then set upon by Tusken Raiders. Maul knew his potential apprentice would arrive, and used him to draw Kenobi out. Once the ship was destroyed by the Tuskens, the boy was forced to walk on foot. As a massive sandstorm surges over them, Maul calls out through the Force. Draw him out. Kenobi sees the lost soul, and will not let him die in the desert. He takes him to the campfire, and comforts who he learns as a young Jedi. Kenobi assures him that it was not the holocrons that wanted him to come here, but more of Maul's manipulation. Maul used your desire to do good to deceive you, and in doing so he has altered the course of many things. Using their bond, Maul tracks the two down, and as he walks up to the man that cut him down 30 years before, Kenobi calmly rises and tells Ezra that he must be the one to finally settle this. And in the words he chooses, it shows a level of peace and goodwill that Kenobi has achieved by meditating all these years in the light side, not addressing him with derision or trolling, but understanding that this Dathomirian Zabrak was a wounded creature, just another thing the Sith had destroyed. And he says that he will mend this wound. I will mend this old wound. Maul, however, is still consumed by his hatred, pointing out how despite Kenobi's noble alliance to the light, he is scraping by on this wasteland of a planet. I have come to kill you, but perhaps it's worse to leave you here, festering in your squalor. Kenobi just watches the creature that has spent a lifetime twisted by his anger, until Maul hits on something sacred. The visions given by the Force did not just show him Kenobi, but the old hermit's role in protecting Luke. Maul teases this fact out, revealing that he knows why Obi-Wan has chosen this world to hide out on. You are protecting something? No. Protecting someone. At this, Kenobi knows their storied history must come to an end. His blue blade ignited, he cannot permit this secret to escape, and Maul feels that all of his training has led up to this moment. While the old man languished in obscurity in the sand dunes, Maul had commanded criminal empires, studied the depths of the Night Sister and ancient Sith rituals, even peered past the veil by merging the light and dark. But Kenobi had so much more, the simple fact that he was carrying out the will of the Force. As these lifelong enemies faced each other for the last time, the battle would be a quick series of saber strikes, the blue blade meeting the double-bladed lightsaber, until a swift and efficient movement brought Kenobi's saber down through the center of the staff and through the chest of this tortured being. Knowledge of Luke was not something Kenobi could toy with. This fight could not be dragged out, but had to be ended immediately. Finally defeated, Blades fell to his side, and Kenobi dropped down to hold the man that had haunted him for decades. Kenobi knew that at the core, they had both lost everything due to Darth Sidious. And with Maul's dying breath, he asked one final question. Tell me, is it the Chosen One? He is. He will avenge us. 
Maul once said that he would never die until he had his vengeance, and so Maul perished knowing that the Sith Lord who had ripped him from his mother, trained him like a savage animal, filled him full of hatred and rage only to dispose of him when he found a replacement. The Dark One that undermined each of his triumphs over Death Watch and Mandalore, over the Shadow Collective and Crimson Dawn. The Sith Lord that killed his brother, his mother, his entire clan, and who now happily rested upon the throne as Emperor of the Galaxy. That Sith would be killed. And fittingly for Maul, Sidious' downfall would come from his apprentice, when Vader would revert back to the light, back to the man he once was under Kenobi's apprenticeship. In training Luke to confront Vader, it would be his archenemy Kenobi's actions that ultimately helped Maul get his revenge. This duel of fates was finally over, and Maul went to his oblivion. Kenobi showed respect for Maul, gently closing the eyes of a man who had killed his master and murdered the love of his life. He then made a proper funeral pyre in the style of Qui-Gon's on Naboo. Maul's legacy would be felt in the galaxy for decades to come with his ship the Night Brother being the vessel used to transport Ezra and Clan Rand's Mandalorians to Thrawn's Interdictor, which was moments away from destroying the newly formed Rebellion. And during Operation Cinder, Leia Organa would sense the impact of Maul's reveal in the Thede Hangar on Naboo, an event that left an imprint in the Force, causing her to grow cold and fearful. But most of all, the Wills, those that recorded the great epics of galactic history, and from whom we learn of the Skywalker Saga, these four shaman the Wills noted Maul as a being of great galactic importance. And that concludes the complete life of Darth Maul. I want to give a special thanks to Displate for making videos like this possible. They have tons of amazing designs from all sorts of fandoms. As you can see, we got Halo, Half-Life, and even Star Wars schematics. This whole thing is metal, and really gives it an extra cool factor and added durability. Perfect for Meta Nerds HQ. And the installation is surprisingly easy. You don't have to put any holes in your wall. No pins, nails, or hooks. Instead, when you buy your display, it comes in this really neat packaging with everything you need to get it on the wall. It's really super easy and just takes a couple minutes. You just use this applied guide leaf paper, peel the sticker off the magnet, and press. Then you take your metal poster and attach it via the magic of magnetism. No messy holes, and it's really easy to swap it out for new displays. Every time you buy a display, you're supporting the creator that uploaded the artwork, since they get a percentage through the art marketplace. And you even get 10 new trees planted with each plate you purchase. Here are just some of the amazing designs, so be sure to check them out by clicking on the link in the description. Clicking that link gives you a discount while helping to support the channel, and I'm sure you'll find some really cool displates. Be sure to check them out and upgrade your artwork. Thanks again, Displate! If you want to see more documentary length videos like this, these longer deep dive videos, then go ahead and check out our documentary playlists with things like the complete history of the Mandalorians or the Kaminoans and the complete history of cloning. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support this channel for free, or check out our Patreon. Be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, Maul said he wasn't dying until he knew that he could get revenge. And the Force will be with you, always.